On July 8, 2014, Israel launched a devastating military attack on the Gaza Strip. Over the course of 51 days, the Israeli military dropped nearly 20,000 tons of explosive on Gaza, a densely populated area the size of Philadelphia, killing over 2,000 Palestinians and wounding tens of thousands more. The overwhelming majority of these casualties were civilians. This strip of land is being bombarded from the air, sea and land. Israel launched at least 160 strikes on the Gaza Strip. And there's one less hospital in Gaza now. Israel today flattened Wafa Hospital. The sheer scale of the attack sparked outrage and condemnation around the world. Israel's month-long pounding of Gaza shocked many people around the world. Mass demonstrations have been held in many of the world's major cities. But in the United States, polls showed the American people holding firm in their support for Israel. This is the latest CNN ORC poll of Americans shows 57% of those polls say Israel's action in Gaza is justified, 34% say unjustified. These numbers were striking, but they weren't new. Over the course of a conflict in which Palestinian casualties have far outnumbered Israeli casualties, the American people have consistently shown far more sympathy for Israelis than for Palestinians. It's very difficult to divorce public opinion on any question from the media coverage that people rely on to form opinions. And I think the most prevalent lesson from looking at the coverage is that the coverage tends to see this conflict from the Israeli side. Israel is a state that implements its right to defend itself and its citizens. In the uh, most recent war uh, in 2014, when we looked at mainstream media outlets, almost by a margin of, of three to one, Israeli spokespeople were overrepresented compared to Palestinian spokespeople. So almost every time you turned on the screen, there was a Israeli representative on the screen telling you Israel is the one that's in a position of defense. It is being attacked. And basically Israel is saying, hey, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that if rockets fly on your head, you are allowed to defend yourself. Add to this the fact that you have American elected officials also reinforcing Israel's right to defend itself. As I've said many times, Israel has a right to defend itself against rocket and tunnel attacks from Hamas. And you hear some of the same framing by anchors who reiterate and reinforce many of the same talking points that the Israeli official spokespeople are making. Israel has the right to defend itself against Hamas, of course, a group that is firing rockets on Israel, coming out of tunnels to attack Israelis. That imbalance there was very significant in shaping the way the, uh, the public understood this uh, conflict. I worked in European media for a long time. The coverage is the opposite. There's Palestinian legislators, Palestinian thinkers, Palestinian intellectuals, pro-Palestinian thinkers, many voices. So let me say very, very frankly, it's very easy to blame the victim. It's very easy to pull out a terrorist label. You come to America and you think that you're an alien. You're looking at a different world or a different planet. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? For almost 50 years, Palestinians have been systematically dispossessed from their land and denied their most basic human rights. But this isn't the story we get in American media coverage. Hamas is a terror organization committed to our destruction. They fire thousands of rockets at our cities. Israel says this is a response to the almost 800 rockets that had landed in Israel from Gaza this year alone. Again and again, the wider context of Israel's occupation simply drops out of the coverage. So that it comes across as this confusing and endless cycle of violence that begins when Palestinians attack and Israelis retaliate in self-defense. Three Palestinians were shot and killed while allegedly trying to attack Israelis with kitchen knives. This cycle of violence continues. When Hamas launches rockets from Gaza, Israel hits back. The cycle of violence presupposes this back and forth retaliation. It's the same sort of thing with a lull in the violence or a relative calm. After three days of relative calm, the violence is once again picking up here in the Middle East. Well, relative to who and to what, right? What's actually going on on the ground is not ever a lull in the violence for Palestinians. In fact, occupation is a system of violence that goes on every single day. It's never about land, somehow. That gets dropped out. It's never about settlements. 
It's always about they hate us because we're Jewish. You know, rational, clear-minded people understand that Hamas is a terror group and it is uh, committed to killing Jews and wiping Israel off the face of the earth. That's not debatable, that's a fact. No sense of how this started, where the animus comes from. Um, it's completely inexplicable in the, in, the, in the way in which it's generally presented. And these people basically kill because they hate, and they hate because they're irrational Muslim fanatics or whatever. Israel is under siege by a terrorist organization. This is not an illusion. American public opinion is generally supportive of Israel because it's been led to believe that Israel is in the right and the Arabs are bad guys. And I think Americans largely get it. They know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are when a narrative is so dominant thousands of rockets without any visible dissent or complication it's it's extremely difficult to make clear to people that it is it is basically a propaganda story israel's mechanism of projecting its propaganda or what they call hasbara is one of the most sophisticated arms of its government it's a weapon of israeli warfare a number of well-funded public relations organizations have emerged within the United States to help Israel justify its policies, especially the occupation and settlements, on security grounds. One of these groups is the Israel Project. In 2009, the Israel Project turned to conservative pollster and rebranding expert Frank Luntz. Frank Luntz. This is the man that reframed the estate tax as the death tax health care reform as government takeover of health care. Now, some critics have called Luntz a spin doctor who manipulates public emotion, but Luntz would reframe that as Fox News analyst. The Israel Project hired him to determine which talking points used by Israeli and U.S. officials over time have been most effective in maintaining American sympathy for Israel. Luntz wrote up his recommendations in a 2009 report called the Global Language Dictionary. If you want to understand how the propaganda works, especially in the US, you need to read the Luntz document. He's really clear that the occupation and especially the settlements are a problem. And he points to polls that show a large majority of Americans actually think that Israel should retreat to the 67 borders. In fact, he says, when you talk about land in terms of 67, you completely flip American sentiment against you. But, and this is his solution, if you bring up the danger of terrorism, you win back the support. The key, Lund says, is the claim that the fight is over ideology, not land, about terror, not territory. In fact, these three words, terror, not territory, summarize the basis of the propaganda campaign in the US. If you want to see this in operation, just look at the coverage of any of Israel's many attacks on Gaza over the past few years. Good evening. In the 60 years of conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, there have been few, if any, days like this one. The scale and intensity of this attack was surprising. The deadliest operation against Palestinians in decades. After an intense three-week assault, 1,300 dead, 5,000 wounded. In late December of 2008, Israel launched Operation Cast Lead, a massive ground and air assault on the Gaza Strip. The Air Force released this cockpit video. Over a period of three weeks, the Israeli military dropped over 600 tons of bombs on Gaza. It isn't clear yet how many civilians were among the... Nearly 1,400 Palestinians were killed and thousands more injured. The wounded were carried on corrugated iron, in private cars, on backs, and in arms. The worst one-day casualty toll in Gaza anybody can remember. It was a brutal, murderous attack, devastating. This attack was murderous. As with the Lebanon invasion three decades before, horrific images of destruction spilled onto television screens around the world. But this time, the Israeli government was prepared. Six months earlier, it had set up a new unit within the Israeli prime minister's office to help coordinate the government's messaging once the invasion started. Israel is defending its actions, saying this assault is in direct response to almost daily rocket and mortar attacks. If you asked any American why that war started, they would say because the Palestinians started, you know, firing rockets at Israel. Hamas keeping up the rocket fire that triggered the Israeli attacks in the first place. Hamas once again firing several dozen rockets into Israel today. We were told endlessly in any media outlet you want to look at 
that Israel had to invade and attack the Gaza Strip because of an unending assault from Hamas and various militant groups in Gaza. What are the goals of that operation right now? To change totally the behavior of the Hamas. It's a terrorist uh, uh, regime that keeps shelling Israel with thousands of uh, rockets and uh, mortar shells. What this forgets is that for the latter half of 2008, there was a very successful ceasefire that curtailed rocket fire into Israel dramatically, almost to the point at which there was none. This was shattered in November of 2008 when Israel attacked what they said was a tunnel building project, killed six Hamas militants. At that point, the ceasefire was off. Now, the New York Times, the so-called paper of record, reported this very clearly one time. The story gets buried on page eight of the New York Times and hardly registers anywhere else. Why? Well, look at the day that Israel chose to break the ceasefire, November 4th, 2008, which just coincidentally happened to be the day of the historic election of Barack Obama. It virtually guaranteed that no one in America would notice. And that's exactly how it played out. When Hamas resumed rocket attacks after Israel broke the ceasefire, Israeli officials went on American television and got away with blaming Hamas for breaking the ceasefire. You know, it was Hamas that unilaterally tore up the ceasefire understandings. It was Hamas that escalated the violence that reached a crescendo on Christmas Day, when we had in one 24-hour period some 80 rockets, mortar shells, and missiles coming into Israel, attacking our civilians. Now, we want to work with the Palestinian government. And the lie was then repeated uncritically by U.S. news media. James, there's no question here, is there, that Hamas started this? Well, look, I don't think Israel uh, had any choice. It was a ceasefire that was broken by Hamas. They fired something like 300 rockets into Israel. Uh, I mean, this is an act of war. What are they supposed to do? Just compare this to how media outside the U.S. dealt with this. Isn't it the fact that during the ceasefire, not a single Israeli was killed? And the reason for that was because Hamas fired not a single rocket. No, I think you're uh, wrong, unfortunately, because during that ceasefire of six months, they were firing rockets on a daily basis. On Channel 4 in Britain, you saw an anchor presenting evidence that the Israeli government itself acknowledged that Hamas observed the ceasefire. This is actually a document that's given to journalists by the Israeli government. And in this document, it says, and I'm quoting, Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. The Israeli official, clearly caught in a lie, attempts to change the subject to how evil Hamas is. But the interviewer doesn't let him get away with it. They were firing rockets, and they're always trying to target civilians. Their main goal is to try to kill children and women. And, and and Mr. Shalom, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you because this document is published by the Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center at the Israel Intelligence Heritage and Commemoration Center, and they say not that a, Hamas not maintained the, the ceasefire. It's not the government, it's, it's a private given, institution. It's given to foreign journalists by the government it's as not, a uh, statement uh, of fact. Listen, now, the facts you would like are, to hear the facts or you would like yes, to I, I invent would, some facts? I would like you to tell okay, me the facts. So the facts these are, are, exchanges like these are unthinkable in the US, uh, even though Israel itself behind the scenes, acknowledged Hamas had observed the ceasefire, something another British reporter forced Israeli spokesperson Mark Regev to admit on camera. There were no Hamas rockets during the ceasefire. Before November the 4th, there were no Hamas rockets for four months. And that's correct. Israel officially recognizes that until it broke the ceasefire, Hamas didn't fire a single rocket. I mean, the propaganda is so powerful that these truisms, literally truisms, are almost inexpressible. It's not difficult to imagine Americans identifying with Palestinians who are suffering, but when your sense of the coverage is that there's something that these people did to deserve this, or that they are affiliated with terrorists and terrorist-minded governments, the fallout of that is an inability to identify with people who are suffering in far greater numbers and in far greater proportion than their Israeli counterparts. Israel can saturate the media with its spokespeople, but there's still the problem of massive Palestinian casualties showing up on television screens. You can't make those images go away. An Israeli official actually said, in the war of pictures, we lose. So you need to correct, explain, or balance it in other ways. Here again, the Luntz document spells out which talking points have been most effective in spinning the brutal reality of Palestinian casualties. He says the first thing the pro-Israeli spokespeople should do is to express empathy for the innocent victims. Unfortunately, innocents do get hurt, and we, we really grieve that. We're sad for every civilian casualty. The entire situation is, is tragic. Once you've done that, Lund says, you also have to get people to empathize with Israelis 
by describing what life is like for them, living in constant fear of Hamas rocket attacks. So again and again, we hear the focused, tested phrase that the rockets are raining down on Israel. We have thousands of rockets raining down on our civilians. Rockets were raining down on Israel. Any advertising executive will tell you the essence of propaganda is repetition. Rockets raining down on southern Israel. Rockets raining down on Israel. Well, Hamas rockets rain down on Israeli border towns. Then Luntz tells PR spokespeople to turn the tables and ask the American people, what would you do? So what would you do in the United States? Can you imagine um, what America would do if it were facing a similar threat? We always try to ask you the question we ask ourselves. What will you do? What would you do? What sort of question is this? Of course, anybody would act to defend themselves against unprovoked aggression, but it is a question that is completely devoid of any context. What drives the society to a point where after multiple devastating wars, they continue to resist with these most feeble methods. They don't want you to ask that question. They don't want you to ask what is behind this? What's the history here? Who are these people? Where did they come from? Why are they so desperate? No, they want you to understand Israeli behavior. Israeli behavior is always characterized as a reaction to unprovoked violence. It's almost impossible to get any view that isn't one way or another shaped by an Israeli perspective. Almost impossible. It cannot get in without facing a firestorm of pit bull attacks to make sure that the line is followed. And of course, there's no greater weapon in the attack arsenal than equating critical coverage of Israel's policies with anti-Semitism. Any fair-minded person who follows Al Jazeera knows it's anti-American and anti-Semitic. You're, Jew you're a Jewish man, correct? Yes, I am. It doesn't, it doesn't come more anti-Semitic than Al Jazeera. Uh, I, um, they, would, they, would, they would do violence uh, to you. Who and who? A journalist at Al Jazeera the would do The people that run that the, network would, they would do, do violence, violence to you. I hardly think so. Abba Eben wrote an article in which he explained to American Jews what their task was. Their task is to show that anyone who's a critic of Zionism by which he means a critic of the policies of the state of Israel, must be either an anti-Semite or a neurotic, self-hating Jew. That covers 100% of possible criticism. Everyone who's trying to tell the American public a different side of the story, um, an alternative view of the conflict that's uh, reality-based, has already crossed a barrier of fear. And I think they've already told themselves, well, I'm going to pay for this, but I'm ready to pay the price. Over just the past few years, the proliferation of social media and internet news sources has made it increasingly difficult for the Israeli government and pro-Israel groups in the US to manage American perceptions of the conflict. Video footage and reporting from the ground bearing witness to the reality of the occupation are now more accessible than ever on the internet. Despite the efforts of the lobby, something really striking is taking place. Lots of young people are abandoning the mainstream media and turning instead to other independent sources. So they have a totally different way of making sense of what's happening, an unfiltered view of Israel's repression. Hey, hey! Oh, oh! The siege of has got to go! As the discourse begins to open, more people are starting to understand this as a rights-based issue, not an issue of radicalism. This is a movement for the rights of people whose rights are being denied, who are living under occupation, who want to live in their country freely, just like anybody else. You can see just so many video clips of kids having their hands smashed by soldiers with batons. You can see just so many pictures of thousands of people being killed, as happened in Gaza. And at a certain point, you, there's a cognitive dissonance. You realize that what you're being told is a pack of lies. In the end, this comes down to a battle for the minds of the American people a battle over the stories they're told to make sense of this conflict, a battle over perception. The more Americans are able to see the reality of occupation with their own eyes, to see images of routine daily violence, of the repression and humiliation that never make their way into mainstream news, the more they'll question the image of Israel as this tiny little David up against the bullying Arab Goliath, and start to wonder if it's actually the outgunned Palestinians who might be the real Davids here. When that starts becoming the dominant perception here in the US, all bets are off. It all comes down to American public perception. That's the one way to change anything. Changing perception and understanding here, leading to a change of policy here. As long as the United States supports Israel, nothing's gonna happen. 
the U.S. government will support it as long as the U.S. population tolerates it. Checkpoint, checkpoint, checkpoint.